In response to an altercation in the Federal Prison for Women in April 1994, the warden of the Prison for Women called in a male institutional emergency response team from Kingston Penitentiary to conduct a cell extraction and to strip search eight women in segregation. Correction services taped the event and the footage was eventually aired on national television. Canadians were outraged by what they saw. In response, the government appointed Madam Justice Louise Arbour to conduct an investigation into those incidents and into the Correctional Service of Canada's management of related issues and events. Arbour's report to the Commission of Inquiry into Certain Events at the Prison for Women in Kingston was released in 1996. The events leading up to this inquiry and the findings of the inquiry are discussed in this interview by Joey Twins, one of the inmates at the time, and Senator Kim Pate, a former executive director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Prize Societies. This comprehensive report included many recommendations, such as the establishment of a deputy commissioner for women, the closure of the prison for women in Kingston, and to accelerate the move toward modern regional institutions specifically designed to meet the security and programming needs of women inmates. So my name is Sue Colley. I am working with Rise Up, uh, Rise Up Feminist Digital Archive, and I've been with Rise Up for probably about five years, and we're trying to build the archive of lots and lots of materials from the women's movement. Great. Okay, Kim, you want to introduce yourself briefly? Uh, sure, Kim Pate. I come to you from the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek, otherwise known to many people as Ottawa. And I'm pleased to be joining you and very pleased to be joining and doing this in conjunction with Joey, who I've known for now, dare we say more than 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from um, originally from Alberta, the Cree Nation, Tree Six, Muscatice, Alberta. I'm from the Bear Clan. You know, uh, my Indian name is Redstone Woman that walks with fire. Uh, yeah. And I do motivational speaking, ceremonies, drumming, singing, whatever, you know, required. And working. Right now, I'm working with uh, the Indigenous youth taking, taking the land back and reclaiming it and unceded territory. So, Fantastic. so we have a healing lodge for the youth, you know, so they can, you know, we have to get them while they're young. At that time, there was a lot of um, um, unnecessary, um, you know, um, conversations from certain guards and, you know, and um, and the way the women were being treated at the time. And it was a lot of suicides prior to that, during that time. And so we went through a lot. You have to understand there was a lot of deaths. A lot of my sisters died, you know, and um, by suicide. And so, um, you know, with all that and everything, and, you know, it took a, um, we, we never heal from that, right? Because it's traumatizing. Because one minute they're alive, you know, the next day they're deceased, they take their lives. It was like um, a domino effect. And, um, you know, we didn't know who was going to be next. And, you know, and, and, you know, speaking of the male guards, you know, like before that, you know, they would throw us in SAG and, you know, uh, do whatever, like, you know, um, I mean, I can give you some uh, really descriptive situations with other women you know, um, prior to this incident and not very nice, you know, and um, it was uh, basically a power and control for the guards to, um, to, uh, to do this, right? And um, yeah, and so um, at that time, you know, I felt, you know, at that, at that specific date, I felt that one of my, my uh, friends, Ellen Young was being attacked so, you know, and that healthcare, there was a med line 
And at that time I had scissors in my hip, in my back pocket, cause I used to do a lot of crafts and everything. Cause that's what kept me uh, on, uh, you know, keep my um, frame of mind going. And um, so when everything happened so fast, you know, and it was screaming and everything. And um, so, you know, um, so we just basically, you know, like it was uh, the six and um, you know, that's, Basically, you know, you had to be there for how the guards are reacting. So, yeah. you know, and being, you know, in injurious behavior and stuff like that, it was very hard for me to, to see my sister suffering like that. You know, it's not a place for anybody to go, you know, um, to be going to segregation and isolation while she's self, you know, slicing herself up or whatever. You know, and uh, that's what they did. You know, they, they threw the women in segregation. Years ago, before that, they used to charge us for destroying government property. You know, so, you know, and, um, you know, because women were injuring themselves. And I guess we are property of CSC Morbid, right? You know, <laughs> so it took some time to change that, you know, that part. And, um uh, <clears throat> and we're still property of CSC, being a lifer, you know, and all that. So, but I don't feel I'm a property of CSC, you know. But anyways, at that time, you know, they were trying to put her in isolation and segregation. And, and the hole there wasn't very inviting, you know. Okay. It's very, um, you're away from everyone and it's very self-isolated, you know. Even, it's like cells. And uh, this is where, and then they had a few cameras on the bottom tier, like there was two levels. And um, yeah, so I don't feel that women were safe in segregation, even with the cameras. Mm -hmm. but anyways, getting back to that. And, you know, everything happened so fast. You know, all I know is, you know, um, it was, it was uh, us fighting with the guards <laughs> that's basically what it was you know it wasn't like we were tired of being punched around and all that so we're not going to stand there and let somebody you know you know do that so yeah and it just went to that point and um i even got amazed by mr gillis and he's six foot four three, close to 300 pounds you know and i told um one of the guards you know, I'm not going to hurt you. I had, and you know, it came out in, uh, in, uh, our board mission. She testified. I was only restraining her. She felt she was being restrained now. So, and, um, restraining and threatening somebody's life is two different things in my, in my, um, way of thinking. Right. And I know I wouldn't threaten anybody, you know? So, but anyways, um, and, uh, after that, it happened like maybe 15, 20 minutes and we ran from there because the guards, most guards are coming. So we just, I basically took off. I don't know where everybody went. The next time I heard them was in segregation. Mm -hmm. They got me like maybe, they called a male goon squad from KP. Yeah. And they came and uh, to the ranges to look for us. They said they were looking for us and they got me and then uh, they took me into segregation. They had dogs too. And, uh, you know, they threatened to uh, tear gas the ranges. And there's women locked up, you know, you, where are you going to go? Like, they're locked up. So um, they took me to SAG and, um, you know, put me in an empty cell and, you know, and then waiting for the other women to come in. I don't know who was all in there at the time. Um, yeah. They already did, you know, the female screws, they, the guards, they... They told me to take my clothes off and I did, you know, I, I complied, you know, and uh, they took my clothes and they gave me pajamas and uh, sheets, a couple of sheets. And there was no toilet paper in the bathroom, like in my cell. So I said, you know, they weren't really nice. So I didn't expect them to be nice to me, but you know, um, I do have human rights, right? And, uh, but anyways, and then they start bringing all the other women individually, right? The male goon squad. And, um, yeah. So it is this... It, 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 we, at the time in segregation when we went in. Yeah. And is this when the other unit came in, the emergency yeah, unit? It wasn't a riot. I, let me clarify that. It was not a riot. 
No. That I, is I, from TSC's words, right? That yeah. did not come out of my mouth. I testified, you know, in the phase one and phase two, you know, and I sat on the phase three and four, right? And I did not say that at all. So, and I don't believe um, the other sister, Brenda Morrison, did the same too. Okay. okay so, of course, the correctional service has to, you know, always has to, you know, make themselves look good in the public's eye because they knew they screwed up. <laughs> and we brought that videotape out, you know, twice, not just once, right? And, you know, from, and we aired it on Fifth Estate and all that. So this was the videotape of the um, yeah, emergency when union. When they were coming unit. in like, days later to strip yeah. search me. Like, yeah, you know, I was sleeping. It's a proven fact, you know. And it, like I said before, they had, they already searched me for weapons and shit. I had nothing, you know. So, you know, um, other than just my clothes I had on, you know, and then to have that. You know, even though there was female guard there to use that um, that knife thing to cut clothes off when somebody's attempting to commit suicide or whatever they do, right? So that was that part. And uh, so they were really uh, malicious to us. They were very brutal. You know, we weren't treated very nicely in segregation. You know, and even it took years later to, you know, actually... Um, to feel normal again. Yeah. So Kim, when this was going on, were you in touch with the uh, prisoners in the um, prison, uh, the people, W? Um, yeah, well, just to back up a bit. So as Joey said, it wasn't a riot, even by correction standards, when um, Louise Arbor's Commission of Inquiry was looking into what happened. Uh, correctional authorities themselves acknowledged it wasn't a riot. To that, um, And the description that I received first was that two women had got into an altercation, and Joey's mentioned that, um, that got, uh, that inexperienced staff intervened in, and then it got a bit out of control, and then women were taken to SEG, and then they were punished. And But by the time the first week had finished, five different stories had emerged from corrections. So let's, I'm just going to park that for a minute and then come back to it. The context, I think, was really important. As Joey said, um, a number of Indigenous, there was growing awareness of um, the fact that prison was particularly damaging for Indigenous women. Uh, a number of women had, uh, had died and committed suicide in the prison for women. Uh, and that was happening at the same time as a group of women, Gail Horry being one, Joey and others as well, were bringing a court action against the Correctional Service of Canada on the basis of the denial of their human rights and the denial of their charter rights because the Charter of Rights and Freedoms had only recently come in, come into effect. Um, so that's part of the context. And the government decides to do what they call a task force on federally sentenced women. And that task force is the first in, in fact, internationally, it's still recognized as one of the best um, prison reform initiatives ever. Um, it was the first and only time that women who had been in prison were involved. So Fran Sugar, Lana Fox, who Joey knows, they were involved in, um, in the task force. It involved... In, community members and groups like EFRI, but also Native Women's Association, immigrant women, black women. It involved a whole group of, um, a number of women's groups. It involved a number of government um, departments. And half of the task force was comprised of women in, in and from prison and women in and from the community, and half was corrections. They came up with the recommendations, one of which was to close the prison for women and to open not prisons, but community-based support service centers uh, throughout the country. So that's, that's the, the context we're in. So with that plan in place, um, so this was just before I joined EFRI. I was involved with e uh, local EFRI out west, uh, but I was working with John Howard Society and I was um, doing some other work and working with young people. And, and I had already seen 10 years of the implementation of the Young Offenders Act, the same theory 
close down prisons for young people, open up community facilities. So I was a little skeptical about what this plan looked like, but nevertheless, I, um, I was asked and, and um, ultimately was hired. I was asked to apply and was ultimately hired by um, the National Office of Elizabeth Fry, right as this plan was going off the rails. So this idea was we're gonna close the prison for women, open up some new regional prisons, um, but they, they stopped the involvement of women in prison. They stopped the involvement of EFRI and all the community groups. And CSC, Correctional Service of Canada, took over implementation. So this, this approach that was premised on community and women themselves in, in and from prison being involved was stopped. And all of the staff who were at the prison for women who knew it was going to close, guess what? Some of the best staff left. Some stayed and they decided they would retire there. But the night that this, uh, these series of incidents started that Joey talked about, the most experienced staff on, um, on that night had six months experience, had not done any basic training. So you're talking about a whole, at that time, there were I think five on that, um, that staff team that night and virtually none of them had experience. The most experienced, in the whole prison that night had about 18 months experience. That was it. And so in addition to that, when I started at EFRI, already a lot of the programs that used to operate at the prison for women were gone. Education programs were being cut. Um, the training programs, the jobs. Uh, shortly after I got there, one whole range, B range, was locked down for over a year. Uh, women's visits with their children, which hardly ever happened anyway, were being um, cancelled at the last minute. So you can imagine, um, and I remember one in particular that, Joy, you will probably remember too, a woman whose child was in a wheelchair. It was a big deal. She was trying to, she wanted to see her child. All of the other women volunteered to give up their time so that she could have time with her daughter. It was focused, the big focus was on getting her there. A day or two days before, they canceled it. So these are women's children being brought from all across the country, if they were even getting the visits. So that was one thing that led to women being upset and some friction between the staff. Um, I'm just fairly new as a, 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 with the national office at that stage. I'm about a year and a half into the job. And the night that I was supposed to hear from a few women, and I didn't hear from them, it was really unusual for them not to call. And so I was a single mom. I had my son who's now going to be 30 in two months. He was a baby. He was one year old. And I just thought I I better go down and find out what's happening. And, um, and because women like Joey and uh, others had welcomed Michael into, I, you know, I took him in. And when I got there, they said that the entire prison was locked down. Um, they unlocked one woman to look after him while I went and met with women. And that's when I, and everything I heard from Joey and the other seven women who were in segregation, every single thing they said was later shown to be true on the videotape. I didn't doubt them, but I, and they told me there had been a videotape, but I actually thought the videotape would have been erased. And later we found out when, during the Arbor Commission, when we asked for other videotapes of things that we'd heard about, an incident that happened just before I was hired, where the dogs were brought in and set on the women and, and the staff had fire hoses, that video all disappeared. Uh, a bunch of them disappeared. So I, um, I believed what I heard from the women, but I, I wasn't sure we'd ever see the video. Turns out we, you know, the video did still exist. Staff, this is, how, this is how important this is and why Louise Arbor made some of the recommendations she did because the staff didn't even think what they did was wrong. Even though uh, the lawyers or somebody, I presume it was the lawyers, told them that men shouldn't have been stripping women. So they took that out of the report. They, didn't, they never did get rid of the videotapes. And so um, they tried to stop them being released. The women, I remember, um, I mean, you probably remember, Joey, it was horribly traumatic because the women said, we want this released if it's the only thing that will result in people believing us. Because by then, media, I was fairly new in the national scene, so media thought I was out to lunch. People thought I had mental health issues. They, um, people talked about the fact that I, you know, even within my own organization, pe people questioned whether I was, uh, you know, I was too close to the issues or whether I'd been conned by the women. And I have to tell you, when I finally did see those videos, 
every single thing that the women told me was in those videos except one incident. And that incident, I still believe happened. It was another woman um, who they, she described a baton being brought up between her legs while she was being held outside the cell. Um, when I watched the video, what you see is her being held outside the cell. You see the staff, the two male officers making motions to each other. And then this, the video skips five minutes. And I'll go to my grave knowing that's when that baton came up between her legs. Everything else, Joy being de you know, uh, deprived of her heart medication, women being having their clothes cut off and ripped off, women being slammed to the floor with a shield, women having their glasses uh, stomped on, uh, women being held up against the wall naked with a shield for up to 15 minutes. Um, women reporting that their shackles had come undone and then being smashed against a wall or with a baton because they reported it. All of that was in the video. So when Louise Arbor is appointed to look at this, well, first of all, Corrections kept saying that we were all making it up. When I say we, they said the women were, and anybody stupid enough like me to believe the women must have been making it up. So there was even friction within our own organization, which we don't talk about publicly, but... Um, there was, you know, some who thought I should just shut up. And, um, and so ultimately when the video came out, what we saw was in fact who was being conned. It was those who were following what Corrections had said and believing that the women and I and others who joined in were somehow the problem, you know, that, that that was in fact the problem was that Corrections was not telling a true story. So the when we're, the ministers were stuck in that position, they appointed Louise Arbor to do a thorough review. She did the inquiry, as um, Joey's mentioned. And when she did the inquiry, two huge things came out. One is that, um, that she said that although there were rules everywhere, the rules depended on who was implementing them. So if so-and-so was in charge and, and if they were acting in this job or they're not some other job, they might decide what the rule was that day. And even though there were rules, those were rules weren't necessarily, fo necessarily followed. So she talked about there being rules everywhere, but nowhere the rule of law in corrections and recommended judicial oversight, that the courts have oversight of corrections, that the only way she could see that being corrected is to do it. Now, fast forward to today, 2020, in the situation we're just having with the structured intervention units and uh, Dr. Tony Dube, who's been appointed as an external um, uh, expert to look at what's happening with the replacement of segregation with structured intervention units, guess what? Same thing. They're being told stories. They're being delayed in getting information. And we were left with the same conclusion. We need to have, to have judicial oversight. The other thing she pointed out is when women like Joey and Ellen and others made complaints and put in grievances, which was the only mechanism they had available to them to raise these issues at the time, legitimate, quote unquote, you know, the grievance system, that they would do, say things like, we're, we're here because we're convicted of something and corrections is supposed to be here correcting. I think I'm paraphrasing, but... Um, yet they're consistently breaking the law. So what lesson are they teaching us? And again, fast forward, we see the same thing again now within the correctional service. And so the other thing that Louise Arbor recommended that has not yet been implemented was that where the way that corrections treats a prisoner amounts to interference with a lawful sanction. So where, so when someone is sentenced to jail, when a judge sentences someone to jail, the judge says, you're going to jail, you're going to be separated from the community. The judge isn't saying you go there to be punished, to be humiliated, to be degraded, to be kept in segregation, to be penalized even further. The penalty is supposed to be separation from society. And so what Louise Arbor said is where the way corrections treat someone amounts to interference with that sentence, that lawful sanction from the judge, then prisoners should be able to go back to court and have their sentence revisited and shortened or eliminated, or if they're serving a life sentence, to have their parole and eligibility changed. And so that was a significant recommendation that has yet to be implemented, but is really, really vitally important. And again, right now, as we've had post-pandemic, and as we're seeing the, what's happening with the structured intervention units, really reinforces we need that kind of judicial oversight, and we need the ability of prisoners to go to court and say, look, I was, I was a minimum security prisoner when COVID hit. 
or I was, I had already been released by the parole board. And because of this, corrections did not release me. They kept me in or they, they kept me past my dates. They didn't give me access to the programs. And so as a result, my sentence is more severe than what the judge intended it to be. And I should get some kind of remedy. And I think those are still stand the test of time as two of the most important in my humble opinion, recommendations that she made. There are lots of other recommendations she made, but those were two that I think we still need to be working on. Right. And so, so are you saying that none of this got implemented? That none of it. No, no judicial oversight. And um, when, when prisoners t went to court to try and get their sentences revisited, they were denied. Is that right? Well, in fact, in order to get out of segregation, Joy will correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory is um, correction said to the women, and even though their lawyer said this isn't legal, th what the women knew is, you know, you guys keep saying this isn't legal, but they keep doing it. And so the, the, what correction said is if you want to get out of segregation, you have to uh, plead guilty to attempting to escape prison, to assaulting and possibly even um, attempted murder or you're not getting out. And so then corrections coerces those kinds of guilty pleas out of women and then does the circular argument of then using that as the excuse for having kept them in seg in the first place. So even though those charges were found to be, uh, they, you know, they shouldn't have been put in place in the first place, they were there and they were used as an excuse for punishing the women further because the women were all kept in segregation for over a year without you know they went the first the first period of time almost 12 days without access to a lawyer without access to phone calls without access to showers without even your basic entitlements you know when i first went in a few days after this had happened women were there in just security gowns basically which is a a fancy word for uh like a horse blanket type of covering um and you know some had um some had a uh, blanket on the floor, everything else was taken out of their cells. And one woman was still fully shackled because she had refused a full body cavity search. That was the other thing. They, they said, oh, the women agreed to a full body cavity search. Well, they were coerced again. They were told if they didn't have a full body cavity search, they would get nothing. They'd still be in shackles. They'd um, still be stuck in that situation. And the one woman who couldn't, for all kinds of past trauma reasons, couldn't face doing it. And, you know, I, I think it, it Personally, and Joey can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it affected all of the women in a very traumatic way. But this woman, um, she was still shackled and she wouldn't agree to any of uh, to the full body cavity search. And so, um, so she was still in shackles. When I asked them about that, um, that day, they said, just nobody in shackles. And I said, I was just up at that time, segregation was upstairs. And later it was downstairs. But at that time I said, I was just up there and she's in, you know, so-and-so is fully shackled. I said, oh, you, you must have been mistaken. It must have been the reflection of the bars. Now those bars were painted, I don't know how many times, layers of white and beige and whatever colors of paint over them. There was no way it was the reflection of the bars. But that is how, that is how much corrections then, and I would say still now, believes they control all of the information they create the records and they control all of the information that goes out of the prisons as well. And so they believe that nobody would believe us. And in fact, it took us um, the better part of a year to get people to believe us. And I, I think I, I'd like to think it would be different now. Um, but at that time, if that video had, if the women had not insisted on that video being released, I still think, you know, I don't think we would have been having this discussion yet because I think it would have been all swept under the rug and would have continued on. And so, yeah, the, the, a couple of recommendations Louise Arbor made, like have a deputy commissioner for women was implemented, but that deputy commissioner for women has no power. She doesn't have power over all of the regional prisons. She had, doesn't have a veto if, if some policy is developed. And so really it's a functus, what's not, you know, legal term for basically it, you know, a nice figurehead, but really doesn't have power. And all of the um, other recommendations for a while, the correctional investigator had a special um, investigator focused on women. They don't have that anymore. Um, but all of the other major recommendations have yet to be implemented. Wow. So, um, so that must be very discouraging, Joey, eh? I mean, 
um, how did you and the other women manage to deal with this after there was a report, there were recommendations, and then um, the, the, basically the, the system turns its back on you again. Um, how did that feel? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't happy about it, you know, but, you know, I gotta think about this one because answer this one is we stuck together, you know, us women, because that's all we have is each other. Right. And it, we, you know, we form families inside, you know, because we spend a lot of time with each other prior, you know, like every day. So we establish our friendships, our family and everything inside. It's totally different world than out here. Right. And so, you know, I believe that's what kept us going was our spirit and people that actually believed us like him, you know, our lawyers, you know, and, you know, in the community, you know, that we're not just a bunch of lying people trying to get, you know, uh, to get our story and whatever. I, but you know what, when we had that support and that understanding from our, our support, it made a lot of difference that we do uh, matter. We are human beings and people do care about us. You know, that was my attitude, my way of thinking and, you know, with, um, and the way, you know, uh, one of our ladies, our friend Ben Morrison passed away. So, you know, um, we've always talked about, it, you know, like, we're just like family, you know, we support each other because that's all we have, you know, and um, yeah. So, um, okay, so the, 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 um, the Elizabeth Fry societies though have been pursuing this for many years, Kim, what do you think, what is the barrier to getting this change, do you think? Well, I think there's a stigma that attaches to people who are convicted and, and there's a presumption that, you know, whatever happens, people deserve if they've been criminalized without any context. And so when I was with EFRI, um, the second year I was there, thanks to the interventions of people like Joey, of Gail Horry, of others, um, EFRI, you know, recognized that the track that they were on in terms of trying to reform the prisons, uh, much like we'd experienced when I'd been working with young people before for the 10 years before, um, that that kind of reform initiative is likely not going to move very far forward unless, um, well, unless you're in charge of it, in which case you're probably, you, you know, there's a better chance of getting co-opted. So, at that, about that time, the, and certainly it got confirmed after the um, our board commission, then, you know, the board and the organization basically said, you know, well, essentially they apologized for not believing the, what we'd been trying to get them to believe at the beginning. Um, but they also said that they were going to focus, then refocus um, the energies on keeping women in community and getting them out as quickly as possible and a vision of women in community. So starting to focus less on trying to reform the prisons and more on decarcerating. And so we started talking about what is it that, why is it that so many women who are in prison are poor? Uh, now as we're having this discussion, when I started with EFRI, about 18% of the women in serving federal sentences of two years or more were Indigenous. Now it's 42%. I mean, that's a massive increase. Um, it, black women has increased as well, women with mental health issues. And so we started focusing on why is it that it's people who are most marginalized and why is it that the fastest growing prison population in this country is women, especially Indigenous women and women with mental health issues. How can that be? Not, you will not find a person in this country who would say when they're afraid, if they're afraid to walk at night or whatever, that the people they're afraid of are poor, indigenous women with mental health issues who are struggling to survive past trauma. That's not who we think of when we think of who poses a risk to us in terms of public safety. And yet that's who's the fastest growing. So it really refocused um, at the national level of EFRI and at the regional levels, and I, I think it persists now. I mean, now, of course, it's, I'm four years out of that now, but um, that really what we needed to focus on is how do we work better at creating a more substantively equal society so there are fewer people being criminalized and imprisoned. So we work on things like guaranteed livable incomes. We worked on things like decriminalizing drugs. We worked on things like developing better supports for women in the community so that 
if they're at risk of being criminalized, we, you know, we try and prevent that. And if they're in prison, get them out as quickly as possible. And as Joey knows, um, we're still, we're, you know, even though, and it was thanks to a lot of the women, when the Senate reformed, it was a number of women who'd been inside, Gail and others who were saying, you know, um, wanting to, and some other folks who I'd worked with who were sexual assault survivors who wanted to nominate me for the Senate. And part of the only reason that I agreed to do that was um, that I saw it as a way to continue the long-term work that was, that was part of it. So that work continues now. And in fact, so important to me are the linkages that as Joey knows, I invited Joey and others to come and help me start off my work in a good way. So Joey helped me open my office in a proper way. I had uh, an elder from this from the Algonquin Anishinaabek, the um, Claudette Commander, open, help open the office. And what was shocking to me was um, when that happened, I was advised that it was the first time on Parliament Hill an office had been opened according to Algonquin protocol, even though they're on unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek. And that, um, you know, we, and for me, it was vitally important because the, and the first speech that I did was about the overrepresentation of Indigenous women in prison and some of the women we we're still working to try and ensure we're getting out of prison and, and some of those struggles continue. And actually, I'm very excited. The last woman who was involved in the April 94, hold on to your hat, Joy, by the end of this month, she should be out. Oh, fair enough. Okay. And so, right on. but it's horrendous that it's had to take almost 30 years to do this. It's a, it's a blight and it's a, I think it's a, a major shame and travesty for Canadians. And, you know, it was thanks to a number of the women's groups who I went to. I was a, you know, I was a novice and neophyte in the, in the national and um, women's community. I came from working with young people and men in prisons and working, uh, volunteering with women escaping violence and um, kids, girls who were in, in you know, in uh, escaping sexual violence as well. And so when I first came to Ottawa, I was, you know, I started reaching out to all these women's groups and, and their first response was, if you can make sure that you're trying to put the, the women first front and center, then we'll support you. And, you know, some of my colleagues at EFRI were really upset about that. I thought that was a great thing. You know, of course we'd put the interests and um, expertise and the experiences of women who were in prison first and we'd work together and try and learn from that. Uh, but that was seen as a bit of a threat by some folks. And so, you know, I think we've learned over the period of time, and I think that the work to really focus on developing a greater analysis that's around substantive equality and a greater analysis about getting, you know, keeping women from being criminalized and imprisoned in the first place. We're not there yet, but that's the, the track we're on. And every step we get towards that, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll see a, a better future long term. Right. So the seeds of that were planted right back then, and you've been working on that ever since. How about, um, I mean, when the federal prison closed and, you, and the government opened up, or well, the correction service opened up regional centres, um, was there a big push to actually stop women getting sentenced at all for minor, for minor or not? Was that one of the points of strategy? That was one of the strategies, but it was ineffective. I mean, the, the, the reason being that, um, as, so corrections, and in fact, there's a woman, um, a professor named Emma Cunliffe, who's a, a professor at UBC at the law school, who just wrote a piece um, a lot, about a year ago, urging any judges who look at testimony that comes from police or corrections to never just accept it at face value. Now that's, that's like revolutionary in, in the law. Uh, and part of the reason she did that is, you know, she's looked at a lot of what's happened with women in prison in particular, going back to the Arbor Commission. And what we saw is when, when Louise Arbor's report came out, one of the next things corrections did, because uh, it came out in uh, April 1st, 1996, the incidents happened in, from April till November, January, November and into January of 1995. Then, then the video was um, aired at the end of January, and then the commission was called in 1995, and Louise Arbor issued a report in um, April 1st, 1996. 
but the prison for women didn't close till 2000. So during that time, the new, and corrections started to try and rush to open all of the regional prisons for women before the prison for women closed and before the Arbor Commission was finished to try and show that oh, that was then, now we've improved. Again, fast forward to this week and last week, you hear the minister saying, well, that was then segregation. Now we're, you know, corrections has got this new approach and we're going to see it vastly improved. That, that ideas, those ideas, that rhetoric has always been, in my experience, the way that they've operated. So one of the things they did was before the new prisons opened, um, they said, well, we only anticipated, everybody agreed women were hardly ever violent, even in what this, you know, they tried to describe this as a riot. It wasn't a riot. Nobody got, you know, seriously hurt at all. If that had been in a men's prison and someone tried to call it a riot, they would have been laughed out of the place. And so, so but Corrections was so uh, insistent on trying to characterize women as violent that they not only took, you know, started to put fences around the prisons that weren't supposed to have fences around. They started to put eye in the sky cameras. They doubled, tripled, and then quadrupled the size of what they called their enhanced unit, which was basically their maximum security unit. Then they put in extra segregation units, all without any incidents having happened, and justified it by the fact that, you know, they'd had all these violent women quote unquote, at prison for women who didn't really get characterized as violent because they were in a maximum security prison, like as if that was true. And, and so the reality is that corrections, by trying to justify what it had done, even when it had been called out, started to build more and more prison-like structures before it had even opened the new regional prison. So by the time they open, they're already starting to look like regional prisons for women. They may have cottages and they may have you know, houses, but they set them up in a way, in my humble opinion, in a way to have them just start replicating. And so very quickly we saw the numbers of women, and of course now you're in a region where, you, or you're in um, Ontario, or not Ontario, in the prairies or BC, and it used to be if you gave a woman, you sentenced a woman to federal time, she'd be going across the country to Kingston, now if she's going to be in her own region, oh, well, you see longer sentences being given out to women, more women being um, sent to prison. And so, in fact, in the short term, well, it's long term for, for people, but what we've seen is a massive increase in the number of women in prison. And I think now it's starting with the realization that, you know, you don't end up with 42% of the women in prison being Indigenous by actually doing the right thing. You've done the wrong thing, clearly, and you're using the prisons for issues that you shouldn't be using them for, for homelessness, for, you know, for shelters for women who have tried to escape violence, for women with mental health issues. And so I think we are seeing the realization, and, and I don't know, maybe I'm just, um, you know, being too hopeful, but I actually think we are seeing a change in that approach. I think the fact that Joey's leadership was finally recognized. I mean, how many times did I have to pull out that damn letter, Joey, that, you know, Joey got a commendation from the, um, from the police chief in Kingston for saving the lives of many women prisoners and staff at prison for women during a fire that uh, an accidental fire that happened in one of the women's cells that you know women were people were still smoking at that time and and every time joey went to before the parole board i'd have to pull out the original copy that she gave me to keep to safe keep and you know that to the fact that corrections spend so much time monitoring and recording all the negative things versus monitoring and recording and encouraging the positive things. I mean, Joey's been a leader as long as I've, as long as I've known you, Joey, you're a leader, you'll always be a leader. And now you're doing incredible stuff in the community, which, you know, what, in my humble opinion, the way that corrections dealt with you limited your ability to do that until you're out in the community. And now you're, you know, you're uh, an incredible role model for many young people, for women, for everybody in the community, for me. So I think those are really um, Im important steps forward that have not necessarily been taken by corrections, but have been, um, are, I think, are changing how corrections is believed uh, now. And when they say these, or when they say things like women are dangerous and violent, you just don't understand, or our classification system is right and you just don't understand. I think finally, the pub, not just 
you know, some of us, but finally the public is starting to wake up and say, hang on, that, that doesn't sound right. And I think, you know, it's about time. And uh, Joey, this commendation, tell us a bit about the commendation that you got and what happened there and um, in terms of saving people's, other women's lives. You mean at prison for them during the fire? Yeah. Well, again, you know, um, the guards that were on chip, they didn't know what to do, right? And uh, myself, Ellen Young, and a few others, right? I believe Emma Lou was one of them. And... Um, you know, um, we told them to turn the power off, the hydro, because that's the first thing you do, right? And um, and then uh, it was completely dark, and, and they didn't even, they said, what should we do, what should we do? Well, <laughs> call the fire department, you know, and get the hose out, and, you know, and we got to get, it was a lot of smoke, so we had to get the women from, you know, in the dark, you know, and, and, and lead the women to safety, to the gymnasium, right? And then same with A-Range. You know, and then and then the wing and all that, right? The wing they were taking care of down there, but we had made sure that, you know, from A range and B range that the the women were okay. And then segregation is that we couldn't get through segregation because there's a lot two locked doors. So you know they had to be take care of that. I don't know how that worked out, but we had to really think fast what's important, you know. And now uh, the women risk their lives to go in that smoke. Cause that's the number one killer is smoke, you know, exactly. and um, the hose didn't even reach that cell, you know, like, and we use that and then we use the hose from segregation and um, you know, they all say, and, but the one at the front didn't even reach the cells like, and B range is smaller than A range, you know? And um, so, yeah. And um, we finally, you know, we we're sewed up in uh Sick, um, gymnasium at that time because everything was covered in smoke and yeah and then they we were waiting and waiting and waiting down in the gymnasium for hours so we can you know at least go to another range to have you know and we were living on other on a range so we could have you know a bed and you know all that because ourselves we weren't allowed to go back to ourselves not for a while you know days so we were living, out of, you know, basically on A range. So the work you're doing now, how do you think that helps, you know, work towards change in the prison system, in the prison for women system? What do I do now? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, as long as I live, I'll never stop speaking about the injustices of our people, our women, you know, in prisons because. Um, you know, it's not only the women, it's the youth now, right? And we have to, that's why I'm so concerned for the youth too, because they're going to be in places like that, you know? It doesn't take long for an Indigenous woman or even a young boy to go into the prison system, you know, because we're targeted, we're a Native, you know, and we're no good, and especially with the COVID, everything, you know? And so, yeah, you know, the beds are going to be filled up. And uh, so we're trying to catch the young ones now, you know, save them from the human trafficking prison and all that. It's important. And, and for the women, you know, um, there's a lot of homelessness, you know, as Kim said, you know, and we come from addiction too, you know, addictive, uh, you know, um, some women suffered from uh, FASD, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome and uh, mental health addiction, you know, um, you know, there are some people, but you know, that don't suffer from that, but we all have mental illnesses. It doesn't matter if you're incarcerated out here, we all got them issues, right? Um, but when we're in prison, we're, we're labeled because we have to, you know, see a psychiatrist, you know, upon entry into a prison. Mm -hmm. Right, and then a psychiatrist meets us for about a few minutes, you know, writes whatever, and then that's it, that's our assessment. And usually uh, a Native woman that goes to prisons because of their, their, uh, their Native, they're automatically uh, on a security level, maximum security. Very seldom you see medium or minimum women, you know, upon entering you know, like Grand Valley, uh, all these other places. And, and has they, they usually go to maximum security. 
And, and has there been any attempts to take this to the Human Rights Commission, no, in, as, as a discriminatory action, Kim? Yeah, so um, five years after Louise Arbour's recommendations uh, were not being followed, we launched a human rights complaint in conjunction with the Women Inside, um, Strength and Sisterhood, Gail Corey's group, uh, Women for Justice, Anne Hansen's group, who, two women who had been in, at P4W, and uh, as well as 20, uh, in total, there were 27 uh, national and international groups who brought a uh, claim against the uh, correctional, uh, against the government of Canada on the basis of sex, race, um, and of course, sex, uh, um, and disability in terms of the number of Indigenous women, the number of women, and the number of those with mental health issues. And they found that Canada discriminated against women on all of those bases that exactly as Joey said, that um, the disproportionate number of women who had experienced violence, 91% of Indigenous women, 87% um, of women overall had histories of abuse. Uh, many of them, if they had been involved or been convicted of a violent um, offence, almost all of that was reactive, a lot of it defensive, but most of it reactive. And I have, in all of my 40 years of doing this work, I've only ever met one woman who committed a predatory act of violence by herself without a man or another person being part of and, and first facilitating that. And so that's, a, that's huge when you consider the difference when you, if, for instance, when I worked with men. And so um, many have been in the child welfare system. Many of them have been homeless, as Joey said. Many of them have... Um, because of the past trauma, they've either been given drugs to anesthetize themselves instead of treatment to deal with the trauma, um, or they've been they've self, you know, self-medicated if they've not had any kind of supports to deal with that. And so we see a lot of addiction and a lot of people with mental health, as Joey said. And yet it's not because people pose a risk to public safety that they're there. It's generally because as, and COVID has really, the pandemic has really laid it bare, the incredible racism, sexism, and ableism of, the, of our inadequate social, economic, and, and health safety nets. And so the only system that for decades has not been able to say no is a prison system. You know, so we end up seeing prisons used for battered women, prisons used for people struggling with addictions, with mental health. And a couple of years ago, um, the Senate, when there was some legislation coming board before the Senate, we tried to make, well, we did make amendments to push for the types of releases and human rights approaches that the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, the legislation that's in place, in fact, the very first piece of legislation I spoke to the Senate and House of Commons about when I was with the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies was the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, Bill C-36 it was at the time as I was starting. And it was supposed to be a piece of human rights legislation aimed at reducing the numbers of Indigenous women, uh, Indigenous people, women, and those with, um, you know, with intellectual or mental health issues. And so we've, we've failed on that, but I do think you know, I do think that we are turning a corner in terms of, you know, like, just look at the defund police, decarcerate um, calls that are coming right now, um, in part because what has been exposed through COVID-19 is the massive inequality. And at the same time, the pandemic of racism has been exposed. And so I actually do think we're going to see more of those changes. And I do think, um, you know, those who've been inside, like Joey, will be part of leading us in those, are part of leading us in those directions, and we'll see very different changes. So yes, there have been human rights complaints. Yes, there have been human rights um, uh, pronouncements. The, the, um, the report that the Human Rights Commission put out is called Protecting Their Rights, and they talk about how uh, women, particularly Indigenous women, are overclassified, put in segregation, put in maximum security. The fact that the entire prison system uh, funnels them in, treats them in a different way than they treat men. All of that is ex was exposed. After that, we then went started going to the United Nations. The United Nations has pronounced on this as recently as um, last two years ago. Uh, Pam Palmiter, Dr. Pam Palmiter, and Dr. Cindy Blackstock, who've done work in this area, we were there, and the United Nations is saying Canada has to do something about this. They're discriminating against children and women, and particularly Indigenous women. They have to change. And I think, you know, um, 
I, I keep saying, I'm sure we're on the edge of it. Um, I hope I'm not sounding too optimistic, but I do think we, I think things are being exposed in a way that it would be very hard for the government to continue on and not change. That's very optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. How about you, Joey? Do you share this optimism? I, well, we've come a long ways, um, you know, with, with the work of Kim and other, um, you know, few people that do uh, side with us, you know, um, I believe there's going to be change, you know, coming down the pipe and, um, you know, and we will win this war, you know, and because, you know, human rights is a, a you know, a right, not a privilege, you know, you. And in order for that to change, we have to come together and, you know, and keep voicing our concerns as Kim has done for 40 years. You know, we'll be doing this till we, you know, hopefully not another 40 years. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I have faith, you know, I have to have faith. And that's what kept me alive all these years inside, Wonderful. you know, yeah. and that hope, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I see them two lights. So, yeah. yeah. Thank well, you. thank you both very much.